to present the plaintiff for today's message on April 7, 2024. Thanks for joining us for our new sermon series called Stay. Today's the first Sunday of the month, and we will be celebrating communion, so take a moment to collect your elements. Some bread or a cracker, a tortilla, or, and something to drink, like I have some juice. Um, we'll have the communion after the message. Please make sure that you download our free app available on Google or Apple. It's the best way to keep up with all things for this one. Please comment on whatever platform you're watching so we know you're here. And if you can, go to our website or app and fill out that connect card. It's the best way for us to be able to connect with you. And we would love to hear from you. Please don't forget to listen to today's worship music playlist which can be found on our YouTube channel and on Spotify. The links can be found on both our website and our app. Please like and share our posts and videos so others can find us. Word of mouth is the best advertising there is. And you can help us simply by sharing our videos and posts. Hit that subscribe button so you don't miss any of our messages. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together once again. We pray that your blessings would be upon our time, that we would get to know you even better, that we would learn how to stay, because you've told us to numerous times in numerous places. Help us to learn that lesson well. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Today, we're going to be learning about staying alert. Now, anyone who has studied biblical prophecy can see the signs that are coming to pass. Jesus is coming soon. In which case, we have a lot to learn, and not a lot of time left to learn it. I'm not a prophet, and I'm like you. I'm a Christian who has read his Bible, her Bible, and is starting to see some things line up in very interesting ways that point to the end time. We're going to be looking at what Jesus had to say about the signs in the heavens from his sermon that's often called the Olivet Discourse. We're going to be looking at Matthew 24, 3 through 8 to start with. The disciples have asked him to explain the end times and what to expect. Don't we all want to know? And as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us. When shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming, and of the end of the world? Jesus answers them and says it is important to understand that, that he's speaking directly to his disciples here. In other words, to Jewish people. Okay? We want to remember that who he's addressing. So we're going to go on Matthew 24, 4 through 5. And Jesus going on in Matthew 24, 4 through 5. And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ. And that they shall deceive many. So first off, he warns them not to be deceived. There's so much truth out there available to us, it's hard to know what to believe. I think we should be getting our truth from the Bible. And that's how we can discern the difference and do not be deceived. Now, that's the crux of the matter, though. We must know our Bible in order to discern what lies, uh, what lines up with Scripture and what doesn't, what lies are available to us. We won't know their lies unless we know our Bible. As we look at the times we live in, there are many things that seem to be lining up with Scripture. But if we don't know, I mean, really know our scriptures, it's going to be very easy to fall victim to the talking heads and their truth. Okay, we're going to keep going. Matthew 24, 6 through 7. And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye not be troubled, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. For nation shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places. 
It sounds like Jesus could be a modern newscaster, though, doesn't it? I mean, the headlines just continue to pour in about war, some saber rattling, some threatening things, nations threatening another, famine and hunger, disease, earthquakes. There was an earthquake just last week near Taiwan. I heard about more earthquakes happening than I ever remember, and in such a short time. Now, if we look at the news, we could be very dismayed. It's it's disheartening to hear such bad things happening all the time. But we should understand that there's nothing new under the sun, and Jesus told us that these things would increase. But what should we do with that information? Jesus tells us to be careful not to be deceived by the world's news, or by those who would like us to think they can fix this problem or that problem. We need to look at our world with a biblical eye rather than a human eye. We also need to recognize that we should not be fearful. Oh, but Pastor Ruth, I'm so worried about the war in Russia coming here or that homegrown terrorists that are coming through the unsecured border. Uh-uh, uh-uh. Jesus tells us to recognize these events as he said in Matthew 24, 8. That all these are the beginning of sorrow. Another version calls these the beginning of birth pains. Now, birth pains or contractions begin when the baby is ready to be born. Sometimes the mother will have weeks or months of practice contractions called breaths and hicks. Even when it's time for the baby born, those contractions can take many hours before that baby is actually born. And we are in the start of these contractions, or birth pangs. Jesus tells us that this will happen before he comes back. So they have to happen. If we're waiting for Jesus to come back and get us, we have to recognize that some of these things have to happen because he's not coming back until they do. Jesus goes on to tell us more about what's coming. But I want us to jump over to Luke 21:25 which says, and there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and the stars and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the seas and the waves roaring. I think Jesus was thinking of this psalm as he said that. That was in Psalm 19, 1 and 2 says, the heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. Now, Psalm 19 is saying that God is constantly communicating from the heavens. But we rarely take time to listen what he's saying until we have some major cosmic event happening. And then we panic. Tomorrow, the United States will have a total solar eclipse. Now, unless you've been living under a rock somewhere, I'm sure you've heard much of the hype about it. Now, whether you're in an area where this event can be seen or not, I challenge you, though, go out after dark at some point and look up. Put down your electronics. Leave your phone in the house. Just go lay down in the grass and gaze up into the heavens. When's the last time you looked at the stars? You get a sense that there is a marvelous creator behind all that we see. Let creation speak to you about him, just like it's meant to. God is communicating in the sky all the time. The heavens declare the glory of God. I live in Colorado, and man, I tell you, some of the sunrises and sunsets here are phenomenal. But we don't pay attention. Sometimes God communication is more specific and direct than others. So what Jesus is saying in Luke 21 is, toward the time of my return, I'm going to be sending you some signals using the sun, the moon, and the stars as my communication device. Now, how might he do this? Well, why do you think he's going to be using the stars above to communicate to us? Well, because God operates in patterns. And he used this pattern to announce Jesus' first coming to this planet when he was born in Bethlehem. 
we're going to go back a little bit and look at that moment. Remember the wise men? They said they knew the Messiah had been born because they saw his star in the east. Now follow me for a moment. Over the centuries, humanity has given names to many of the stars and constellations in the sky. We've even named the eight planets in our solar system. Most of us don't give what's up there a lot of thought. We live here on Earth, and Earth seems to be a pretty big place on its own. There are some that are very much into the cosmos. But let's think of this. Jupiter is called the king planet. It's give or take slightly larger than 13, or 1300 Earth. One of the brightest stars in the sky after our sun is called Regulus, and it's called the king star. It's about three times the size of our sun. Our sun fits over a thousand Jupiters or 1.3 million Earths inside of it, just trying to get a scale. Regulus exists within the constellation of Leo. Leo is called the King Constellation. Leo contains stars that are hundreds of light years away from each other. And one light year is 5,879 quadrillion miles. Now that's with 12 zeros. So it isn't just a science lesson. It's meant for us to understand as Bible-believing Christians. So let's go back in time to the year 3 B.C. If you were watching the stars from Earth's perspective, you would have seen the following phenomenon. That planet Jupiter, remember that great big planet, passed over the top of Regulus, the king star. Then it passed back over Regulus two more times over the next few months. So in astronomy, this is called crowning. Jupiter crowned Regulus in the constellation of Leo. Now, between late B.C. and mid-2 B.C., the king planet, Jupiter, crowned the king star, Regulus, in the king constellation, Leo. King, king, king. You see why those wise men were a little sure that they knew that the, the Messiah had been born. Okay, so do you want your mind home just a little bit more? Consider that the light from Regulus would take about 79 years to reach Earth. And the rest of the stars in Leo are even further away. In other words, God put something into effect at the time of creation, before Jesus was born, to announce his birth. God knew from the beginning what was going to be needed. And he put it all in place even in the stars. So these wise men of Persian were astronomers, and they saw this king, king, king happen, and they knew exactly what it meant. Remember, these are the descendants of people directly taught their craft by the prophet Daniel himself. So they know what this means. So when these eastern astronomers saw a crowning of the king by the king, in the king, they could help but gather a gift, mount their camels, and follow the star westward, which led them to Israel. As they followed this planet Jupiter, it came so close in the sky to the planet Venus that the two looked like they had merged in the night sky. Jupiter is called the king planet. Venus is called the mother planet. And this merger took place inside the constellation of Virgo. So guess what Virgo represents? Oh, you got it. Virgo is the virgin. This conjunction of the biggest star in the sky, the brightest star in the sky, not only signaled something was up between the mother and the king, but their combined light produced what appeared to be the brightest star in the sky, during the wise men's lifetime. Now, can you see how the heavens can tell a story or signal an event? That's what Jesus is talking about here in Luke 21, when he says, quote, Then there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars. Listen up! 
God has announced the first coming of his son by forecasting it in the stars 2,000 years ago. And he's announcing the second coming of his son by forecasting it in the stars today. How's he doing that? Well, okay, in Matthew 24, which is the parallel passage to Luke 21, Jesus gets much more detailed about these heavenly events. And that's what I want to walk you through for the remainder of our time today. Turn now to Matthew 24. Find the first 29. It's going to describe four events. Jesus says, <clears throat> The sun will be darkened, the moon will not shed its light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Here are four cosmic events that foreshadow the end of days. One, the sun will be darkened. Well, that happens during the solar eclipse. The second, the moon will not shed its light. That happens during the lunar eclipse. The third is, stars will fall from the sky. Well, sounds like a meteor shower, or maybe a series of comets, doesn't it? And the fourth is, the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Well, the powers of heaven could be spiritual warfare, but I think there might be another thought, and I'll touch on it in a moment. Now, we may not be able to understand everything that's illuminated in this verse, but let me tell you what we do know. We're going to talk about eclipses. we got one coming tomorrow. According to the Jewish tradition, solar eclipses are signals about the Gentile nation. Lunar eclipses are signals about the Jewish nation. So, just a little bit of context before we go any further. Jesus starts talking about the signs in the sky after the following happens on earth. We're looking at 24-6. Things like wars and rumors of wars, or nations rising up against nations and false prophets appearing on the scene. A rise in lawlessness and the love of many growing cold. Not like I asked before. Did that list describe everything we see on the evening news? Absolutely. And that's the first sign, that there will be solar eclipses. If you can remember back a few years ago, August 21st, 2017, our nation spent an entire day tracking a total solar eclipse that crossed over the United States from one shore to the other, moving from west to east. That time, there was a full continental eclipse over our nation, or the last time, was on June 8, 1918. So, let's look back at what happened in that one. That's when Spanish flu hit our nation and caused a lot of sickness. That flu pandemic infected 20% of the world's population, and it resulted in 675,000 American deaths, somewhere around 40 million deaths worldwide. Now, before 1918 solar eclipse, there was another solar eclipse that spanned our entire nation. And that eclipse took place on November 30th, 1776. Well, you should know what happened then. 17,000 Americans died during the Revolutionary War. And we were a much smaller nation, so that's a huge number. All right, so let's review. So our first continental solar eclipse as a nation took place in 1776. The second in 1980. And the third was just three years ago. Would you like to guess this next solar eclipse? It's tomorrow. It is the last day of the Jewish calendar, and it is exactly two weeks before the Jewish holy day of Passover, which is a time when Jews are going to be selecting their lambs for sacrifice if they had a temple to sacrifice them in. Okay, I admit this may be coincidence, but I believe God is trying to tell us something. Remember, solar eclipses are signs about Gentiles. Lunar eclipses are a sign about the Jews. Matthew says the sun will darken and the moon will not shed its light. So there will be lunar eclipses as well. Through the prophet Joel, God says, I will display wonders in the heavens and on the earth. Blood, fire, and columns and smoke. 
the sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. All right, the moon looks like it, like it turns red during a solar eclipse. And for that reason, a total lunar eclipse is called a blood moon. Okay, now listen closely. Four times over the last 500 years, there have been four blood moons that held on four Jewish holidays over a two-year period of time. Now, theologians call four blood moons lining up like that a tetrad. The first tetrad happened in 1492 and 93 under King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain. Now, we kind of think of 1492 as the year Columbus found America. But lunar eclipses are signs for Jewish nation and for the Jews in 1492 at a very different significance. Many Jewish people had settled in Spain to escape persecution. But 1492 was the year that Ferdinand and Isabel kicked all the Jews out of Spain. From that time on, they had no place to call home. It was the beginning of the regathering of the Jews that eventually resulted in Israel being re reborn as a nation in their own land. Now, the second tetrad happened in 1949 and 1950. Israel was holding their National Independence Day in May of 1948, but it took them another nine months to get their government up and running. So this second tetrad is signaling the coming back of the Jewish nation. Guess when that third tetrad happened? That's right, that third tetrad happened in 1967 and 1968. At Israel's rebirth, she controlled only half the city of Jerusalem. But during the Six-Day War of 1967, it regained East Jerusalem. And for the first time since 70 AD, Gentiles were no longer trampling the holy city because the Jews controlled it all themselves. Now, there's one more. The most recent tetrad took place in 2014 and 25. You might remember some hype about the four, four blood moons during this time. We believe this tetrad signaled the beginning of the rebuilding of the temple. Now, it hasn't happened yet, but it was during this time that a group was formed behind the scenes to make it happen. And now, the red heifer has been found. It's been found. In fact, there are four of them that are of age and are prepared to be sacrificed. So we've got the solar, the sun will darken, the moon will darken. Jesus' third sign from the sky in Matthew 24, 29 says the stars will fall from the sky. I believe he's saying that there will be meteors or comets. Meteors are com impacting us every day. Impact in one day, we can, the same day we see our solar eclipse, which is tomorrow, we're going to see a comet in the sky. And this comet is called the Devil Comet, or the Horned Comet, because of its shape. Coincidence? Uh, maybe to the average person, but we can see the parallels in Scripture, and that makes one wonder. Looking at history, a huge meteor exploded over Russia in 2013 setting off a blast that was 30 times more powerful than the Hiroshima bomb. More interestingly, some of us over 45 might remember the UFO craze of the 1970s. Then you probably think, well, it's not gone because it's taking off again. Pilots, people at sea, and others are seeing strange things in the sky that they can't explain. And the fourth sign is going to be the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I, I have thought long and hard about this one. What is the physical power of the heavens? We've been talking about it the whole sermon. Besides God, of course, what makes life on earth possible? Well, stars, in our case, the sun. Because without the sun, we'd freeze to death in a few hours, or starve to death, or suffocate when all the plants die. So, what is the power of the sun? The sun works with thermonuclear fusion. So what's an atom bomb? Thermonuclear fusion. Now, the Bible doesn't say that specifically, but to me, it's a little logical. Anyway, this is not a, thus says the Lord moment. This is a, eh, Ruth is speculating. I think something like a nuclear 
major war will happen somewhere in the heavens. Every week in the news, many experts say that there's a possibility of nuclear attack, and it's increased more in the last few weeks than it has in the last 10 years. Both China and Russia are looking at the U.S., and they see weakness, both in our culture and our government. And the number one best way to encourage attack by a bully is to show weakness. So perhaps this heavens being rolled up is, is an EMP device. It's a low radiation yield bomb detonated at high enough altitude that will permanently take out anything with a transistor in it, which anything electronic, including our power grid, would take only one to put out the lights in the entire nation of USA. I think it's a possibility. So, so far we see some small instances could be interpreted as these events proclaiming the end of time. But I'm not done yet. Jesus continues his description of the end time as we go into Matthew 24, 30 and 31, where he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky, and all the peoples of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet, and they will gather his elect from the four winds from one end of the sky to the other. All right, so there are three more signs of what's to come. The first one is the Son of Man is going to come on the clouds of heaven. Second one, there will be angelic company. And the third one, he will gather the elect. Now, after giving these signs in Matthew 24, Jesus gives us some application. He continues in 32 through 44. He gives us seven warnings that we need to heed in these last days. Let's look at these seven warnings. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read that entire section, but I'm going to refer to specific verses. So warning number one is that we must keep watch for the signs. It's, uh, for those who are looking, we will see the signs. But we need to acquaint ourselves with the signs. The second warning Jesus gives is that he will return within that generation. Now, this generation certainly will not pass away until all these things take place, is what it says. There are various interpretations of a biblical generation, so I really can't be sure. I've heard it 20, 40, or 80 years. And we don't know if the countdown began in 1948, 1967, or 2018. But I do believe the countdown has begun. The third warning Jesus gives us is he's going to come on a day when no one knows. Verse 36, most scholars believe that that no one knows the day nor the hour in which he will return is because that's what he said. But Messianic Jews, those who were Jewish but became Christian, have now taught us within the Jewish belief there is a holiday called the day no one knows. All right, a little background. You and I live according to the Julian calendar based on the solar calendar. However, all Jewish holiday days are timed by a lunar calendar. Those are the phases of the moon. Most holidays start a few days or weeks after the first of the month. But one holiday starts on the first day of the month. And since the first day of the month is determined by the new moon, the holiday can't be declared until the new moon is sighted. So in Jewish tradition, Two witnesses are required to watch the last of the moon disappear on the last day of the year. And when these witnesses see what is called the horns of the moon, which is that little, little, that little sliver of the moon's light, they report to the chief priest that the new moon is upon us. And at that moment, he declares a holiday. So no one knows when the holiday will start until the chief priest declares it. So the Jews' nickname for Yom Terah, which means a day of blowing, or the day no one knows, Yom Terah happens on Rosh Hashanah, which is the Jewish New Year. Now stay with me. 
Jesus' fourth warning was that those who are not looking will not be ready. He says they'll be eating and drinking just like the people did in the days of Noah, right up until it's Sunday day. Those who aren't looking for the return of Christ most likely don't even know Christ. So it's our job to help them to be ready by telling them the good news of Christ. Fifth, Jesus' fifth warning was to us because we should be constantly watching for him. My translation says, be alert. Other translation says, keep watch. Like a military guard walking a post, alert at all times. Hence, the title of this sermon, Stay Alert. We all get carried away in our own little world in the day-to-day -day activities, but we can't allow these to keep us from paying attention to the signs of the time. And while we're watching, Jesus told us to be ready. We're to be ready for his return at any moment. The entire chapter of Matthew 25 was all about being ready for Jesus' return. Now you might be asking, how can I make sure I'm ready for Jesus' return? Jesus tells us in Matthew 24, 46 through 47. He says, blessed is that servant whom the master finds doing his job when he comes. Truly I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. A servant who's ready is a servant who's doing his or her job. That means actively serving the Lord through prayer and service and sharing their faith. It's someone who finds time to read their Bible daily, spend time in prayer, and is willing to live their life in a way that looks very different than this world. And our last one isn't so much as a warning as a description of the reward that you'll receive for being ready. Jesus says this in verse uh, 47. Those doing their job when he returns will reap a great reward. All right, that's great. I'm looking forward to reward. But the warning comes in that the opposite is also true. Which one will you be? Will you stay alert and be ready and be the servant found working? Or are you going to be focused on eating and drinking and focused on your own self and what's going on and not paying attention? So let me close here. Friends, in these last days, God is up to something in this world. He's building a community. It's a community of people who are related to him by faith or one another in love so that he can bless us and through us bless the world. But that community is almost complete, but not quite. Matthew 22 and Luke 14 are twin parables about a king who invites people to his son's wedding feast. Many refuse the offer, so the king says, Go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. I believe we are standing on the threshold of a divine harvest that will dwarf anything else in history. Because God, God has decreed that his house will be filled. Our job is to be faithful lovers and sharers and to be living out God's truth so we can share it with others. That's what it means to be ready when he comes. For our closing today, I'm going to read Jesus' best friend's world, words to this generation. Now, the Apostle Peter is speaking. If you live like this, you will have no worries about how Jesus is going to find you when he comes. This is found in 1 Peter 4, 7-11. He says, the end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 
To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. This week, I want you to stay alert and be looking up because your redemption is drawing near. Now, it is time to celebrate communion, so I hope you've had some time to collect your elements, some bread or a cracker and something to drink. Who can come to the table? This table, Jesus has set. Anyone who calls Jesus Savior, because this is Christ's table, and he is the one who invites you to participate. Those who come to this table are not limited to those of a specific nationality, race, gender, or political identity, because this table belongs to the God who recognizes us to one another and welcomes the hungry to partake in the feast which God has prepared. So come, you who are broken and you who are whole. Come, you who have failed and you who are faithful. Come, regardless of your race, your sexuality, your gender, your nationality, or even your social status, because this table is for you. And it is Christ who invites you. It is Christ who made you the way for you. If you feel Christ is calling you here, you are welcome. The table is prepared. Let's prepare our hearts. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful for the provision you have given us, that you've taken such good care of us. We ask that you would bless this time together. Help us, help us to be more like you, to... Uh, to have this time with you to recognize our need for you and to celebrate the communion that you have given us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took some bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink this in remembrance of me. Thank you. For when of you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you for watching today. Please join us on Tuesday at 7 p.m. for our Zoom Bible study. The link can be found on our website or app under that. If you cannot attend in person, please email me at pastorruthking at yahoo.com and I will help you do the study on your own. Please complete the connect card on our website or app and comment on whatever platform you're watching so we know you're here. Your comments really give us encouragement. And if you find that this ministry is a benefit to you, please consider supporting us. The easiest way to do that is by using the gift tab on our website or app. All donations are tax deductible. And we are looking for volunteers to help with our online presence. There's so much to do, and we want to be able to reach more people, but we just can't do it all by ourselves. So if you're tech savvy, enjoy social media, like to edit or create videos, maybe you'd be interested in helping create a children's ministry or a music ministry. We would love to have you help. Just let us know how you can, you can help us. Or if you want to just have a conversation, give us a call on the website. Your phone number's on the website. So this week, don't forget, you're supposed to be stay. Stay alert. Keep looking up. Keep watching. Don't be fearful, because Jesus has you in the palm of his hand. I hope this week you can find a way to be a blessing.